Good afternoon. I'm going to continue our lecture because we've got some important topics to finish up before test two. And we, I'm going to divide it up into just two lectures. We've already had two today during normal class time. And so we're going to finish up chapter five by talking about cooperativity, a bunch of graphs, and a little bit of math. And then we're going to get to the medical applications, which are going to be in the next section. So we ended up talking about the structural changes that started in hemoglobin and the nature of those changes, small but significant and replicatable, and you can see them all in all the different crystal structures, grown with oxygen and without. With a bunch of oxygen, you always get hemoglobin in the R state. Without the oxygen, you get it in the T state. You can also get into some, and your book gets into a little bit of the difference between T and R. For me, I want to focus more on the fact that the T and R state all go together. We're not going to look that much at the intermediate ones. But the thing that you need to know is that um, you have these crystal structures that always go the same way when they're flooded with oxygen or empty of oxygen. In between, because you have four subunits that can be in either state, you know that when one changes state, the others are influenced to be more likely to, to change. And when you have some oxygen, it influences the others to be in the more oxygen binding form. The more R oxygen you have, the more R you have. And the more R you have, the more oxygen you can bind. That's why the curve gets so steep. This is what we call binding cooperativity. When you have one event that makes a second event more likely. Technically, I should say that's positive cooperativity. Negative cooperativity can happen as well when one event makes the next event less likely. But negative cooperativity is uh, its harder to define, and it can often be an experimental artifact. It can be not real, is what we're calling. So binding cooperativity in the positive form can do some good things. And negative cooperativity can happen but it doesn't do anything for the cell, and so it's more likely to be an experimental problem. So cooperativity is where you have many acting as one. Remember that we talked about it when we talked about protein folding. One interaction for protein folding can, fold, um, can form others, especially in highly cooperative proteins like RNAs, uh, the one that we showed. So when one oxygen binds to a hemoglobin, it's like the protein core forming, one interaction forming causes the others to interact. Now it seems like it's something special, but it's actually fairly easy to set up. All you have to do is have a connection between the sites that results in the sites being more open or receptive or more in the right configuration. In the case of hemoglobin, it's the sites that are more um, with the iron up in the middle of the heme rather than the iron down from the heme. And just that nudge makes the sites more like the, the R state and more receptive to oxygen binding. So there's actually a social aspect to this. There's a social cooperativity. I'm sure you're uh, aware of the fact that social media can form mobs, right? Where everybody is always thinking, the group think, everyone's always thinking the same thing. It's easy to agree. It's hard to disagree. Well, this is actually a bit of a social cooperativity idea. And I have to mention this just because there's this um, philosopher that I read named Rene Girard. He's also a theologian. And he talks about mimetic theory. He talks about the story when Jesus was in, uh, defending the woman who was caught in adultery. And one person has to be the first to throw the stone in that case. Jesus knew that. And Jesus short-circuited the stoning of the woman by saying, he who is without sin, let him throw the first stone. The important thing about that is that once the first stone is thrown, then the second stone is much easier to throw, third, fourth, and then you have the stoning. So what you, um, it's actually the same idea, except in that case, it's human psyches copying each other um, and all doing the same thing. It's a bit less, uh, there's not moral or ethical dimensions to what happens with the proteins, at least until humans get involved. But I have to mention it just because I think Rene Girard is one of the most fascinating readers I've ever read. I actually put him on a par with Darwin. 
So to tell you, um, and he talks about the Bible and interpretation. So if you have that in another one of your classes, I do recommend thinking about him. Uh, he's not right on everything, but neither was Darwin. So there you go. So the thing is cooperativity can happen whenever you have two binding sites that are connected. So uh, cooperativity can happen with a, just a plain old dimer where you have a binding site that is um, connected to another binding site through an interface. So the way it could work is like this. If you have a flexible binding site, and let's just say you have some ligand out there, when the ligand binds into the first site, it stabilizes the site which stabilizes the interface because it stabilizes the rest of the protein. And that stabilizes the other protein a little bit. You see how it's wiggling a little bit less on the left side. By forming the binding site, uh, like pre-forming it, then it makes the second binding site more likely to close down on the ligand and form a high affinity complex. So this is a simple mechanism. It doesn't require specific structures beyond the usual protein folding and you see how this actually combines protein folding cooperativity with protein binding cooperativity. The main thing is the second site is more likely to bind once the first site binds and this will steepen the curve. This will make a different shaped curve than a plain old hyperbola like we had from myoglobin. So cooperativity happens whenever one binding site changes the shape and affinity of another. It can even happen in chemistry, no biochemistry here at all. Here you just have some chemistry that's a double propeller that has four binding sites for cadmium. And this is not very much like hemoglobin except that it has four binding sites that are connected. When one site forms, it tightens the other sites and makes them more likely to form. So I want you to see how even this has cooperativity. It makes total sense that hemoglobin also will be cooperative. So the way that it will look like, if you have um, just a plain old binding site, it follows a hyperbola. If it's low affinity, then it will follow the lower hyperbola. High affinity will follow the higher hyperbola. You see that the P50s for the two of those are just like we talked about. The P50 for the high affinity state is probably a hundred times lower than the P50 for the low affinity state. By lower, I mean tighter affinity, right? Because we're talking about P50s, which the lower you are, the tighter the affinity. So um, that's the thing is what you have if you have like let's say that you had some kind of way to freeze hemoglobin in all the T state, you would get the curve on the bottom. If you froze hemoglobin in all the R state, you get the curve on the top. The important thing about both these curves, they are both um, hyperbolas. But you get something different in real hemoglobin that can switch and move from T to R. When you have that happen, then you get the cooperative steepening of the binding curve. You actually start off on the low affinity state because at low oxygen concentrations, you're in the all T state. You're on that line. At high concentrations, on the other hand, you are at the other end of the curve and you are on that line. But um, in between is where the interesting stuff happens because in between you're switching from the lower line to the upper line. And so that means that in between you start to have a steeper curve and then it tails off and it matches the other line. So that's what, you, that's what you have here. And what's really important about hemoglobin, myoglobin just has one uh, curve, a simple curve and a simple reaction to oxygen concentrations changing. But hemoglobin has two places to be. And two places to be means that it has two partial pressures of oxygen at which to bind or let go of oxygen. And so if you have it in the lungs, in the lungs you have a partial pressure around 12 in the tissues, it's much lower. It's around four. And that means that the, the lungs and the tissues will be at different points on the curve. This is why we had the foundations, because the foundations was exactly about not just points on the curve, but differences between points on the curve. And what a difference in the x-axis results in different behavior on the y-axis because of the complexity of the curve. So the thing about hemoglobin, it loads up on oxygen. It, it needs to bind oxygen at the higher partial pressures, and then it go travels to the tissues, and there it needs to let go of its oxygen there. 
So hemoglobin is all about not just what it does in one place, but the difference between what it does in the lungs and what it does in the oxygen, uh, what it does in the tissues, okay, with the oxygen, right? That's why you have the foundations. And notice that this is all about differences in the X axis and how they go with the differences on the Y axis. Let me say that the way it walks you through is AX and BX are equal differences on the X axis, but they are different on the Y axis. And the key to this is that the difference between the X axis, when it goes from the lungs to the tissues, is having a difference on the x-axis and that results in a difference on the y-axis that you can tell by reading the graph okay so go through and uh, when you go through this you uh, hopefully have already gone through this but you need to go through this I'll tell you the answer um, compare and contrast the change for ax and bx they are the same but ay and by in part 8 are different if we go back and look at it AY is smaller than BY. So the same difference in X will have a bigger BY difference, a bigger difference in Y, if it is on the steeper part of the curve. That is how hemoglobin works. So if you look at this, cooperativity will actually work better than, let's say that we had a medium affinity state that was myoglobin but it was medium affinity, so it was between the high affinity and low affinity lines here. You can try to um, draw a curve, but what matters is what is the, uh, when you have the difference in X between 4 and 12, what is the difference in Y that you get? It's not about the absolute value of Y, it's about the difference between loading up in the lungs and letting go in the tissues. The bigger the Y axis difference, the better the oxygen transport will be. So you can try it, uh, and you can try all day to draw a hyperbola that will be some sort of halfway point that will be a bigger difference in the Y for the same difference on the X. You can't do it. It's not possible to have as big of a difference for those set um, values for X you cannot get a bigger difference for a medium affinity myoglobin than you can for a cooperative hemoglobin. And we don't make you try it because you can't do it. We're just saying you can't do it. You can try, but you can't get as big of a difference. So cooperativity, um, the, the steepening of the curve for hemoglobin is a sigmoid. We call it a sigmoid because it is S-shaped. So this is where the terms that come together for cooperative binding. When we say sig it's sigmoidal, we mean it is S-shaped, and that means it is steep from out cooperative binding. Now hemoglobin will also say that it's allosteric because oxygen binding causes it to adopt the second shape. Um, so it, it's uh, the, the second shape, it's allosteric means it adopts another shape. Allo means other, steric means shape. Hemoglobin is also homotropic because oxygen binding causes a change in shape that causes more oxygen binding. Oxygen is what binds and causes the same the difference in shape. Now you can have heterotropic molecules, and we're going to have an example of one of those in just a second. The BPG molecule we, that's coming up is a heterotropic allosteric regulator because the BPG binds and it causes a cooperative change in oxygen binding, okay? It actually causes a negative cooperativity uh, change for oxygen binding. The main thing is that uh, that is heterotropic. Oxygen changing its own binding is homotropic. So I have a thing right here and I want you to think about this. I usually like to ask this question in class, but I'll ask you sitting there right now. Uh, I have a statement at the top. And it's wrong in a certain way. Carbon monoxide blo blocks binding sites, that's true, and reduces the hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen. That is not quite true. So I want you to think about that for a second. Look at the graph down here. That's what CO does. What CO does is it, um, w for that statement to be true, that statement at the top is true for carbon monoxide curve for some partial pressures, but not for all. For an anemic individual, where you simply don't, you have like half the concentration of hemoglobin, 
half the concentration of hemoglobin is truly reduced at all partial pressures. But what is weird about the graph? Take a look at it and find the weird part. You can pause it. I'll go on and tell you where the weird part is. The weird part of the graph for the CO binding curve is on the left when you look at the low partial pressures. At the low partial pressures, carbon monoxide binding, 50% of the sites being occupied with carbon monoxide, will actually bind oxygen a little more tightly. And it's only when you get to higher PO2s that you will actually have a reduced affinity for oxygen. Okay? And you'll also definitely have a reduced difference between the lungs and tissues, which means you will have reduced overall oxygen transport. But pay close attention to the words. Hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen at some partial pressures is increased by carbon monoxide. Down at partial pressures around 2 or 1, you actually have an increase in affinity. That's because the CO actually is binding to half the sites and it causes the other two sites to move more toward the T state. I'm sorry, I said the wrong. CO binding causes them to move toward the R state configuration where they have higher affinity, tighter binding for oxygen. That's why you see the curve there. Now the CO occupies half the sites. So once you get to the level where oxygen is trying to occupy most of the sites, then you actually have the sites already occupied. But that's, so that statement is partially true, but if you say that and you choose that as the best statement on multiple choice, that gets marked wrong if you have another statement that allows for the fact that at low partial pressures, the line for 50% CO is actually above the normal hemoglobin line. The affinity is increased. The affinity is tighter. So, that's one way to think about that, and I recorded that so that you can go over that again. I made sure I said that right, and I corrected myself the one time I said something wrong. So how do we draw this with an equation? We're going to go back to this, and the sigmoidal binding curve is really cool, but it's hard for me to draw in a lab. It's hard for me to fit on a computer. What I want to do is I want to get that sigmoidal line into a straight line version so I can be sure whether that line fit is good or not. I can tell if I can fit a, a linear line, a straight line. I can't tell if I'm fitting a sigmoidal line well. Well, the good news is, using math, we can take one form of a line and we can turn it, we can convert it and transform it into a linear form that is actually useful in the lab. And that's what we do right here with this math. So here's where we have some of the math right here. We start with the same thing that we started with with myoglobin, except we change it in one important way. Instead of P plus L, we have P plus NL. And all the Ns are going onto one P. And so that actually follows the Ka gets transformed to be uh, an exponent on the L, because that's the rule that we follow. Actually, if you want to know why these rules are there, take physical chemistry with me, because physical chemistry will cover why that, that n turns into an exponent. But here we'll just say the general chemistry conclusion that that's what you do to write an equilibrium constant. So we have this form, and by the way, oh, I'm sorry that it still has theta. We've changed that now. It should be y equals l over l plus kd. So uh, I just realized that's different, but I'm not going to change it. I'm just going to have you substitute y into there. Um, so that changes that equation to so all the L's get exponents. Okay, that's still not a line, but we're actually getting closer because we can take this, which is something we can draw, and we can convert it into a line. So here's how you rearrange it. I'll show you the different things. You start off with the equation on top, and you move those things over, and then you cross multiply. And then that leads to the equation that is now on the second level my animation skills aren't quite to the level where I can do this all in one row. But now we move to the second row, and we still have that exponent. We need to get rid of the exponent because a straight line does not have an exponent to it. So let's get all the exponents on one side. That's the first thing we do. Then we move to the third, um, the third row. Now we move all the exponents together. We uncross multiply, whatever that is. 
we factor it out. And then we move the 1 over theta, 1 over 1 minus y, to be all on the same side. So we move our theta slash y all to the left. We move everything else to the right. And here's where we do the mathematical trick. Logarithms follow the, the solution log of x to the y equals y times log x. Logarithms let you move the exponent out of the log and into the front. So we just take the log of both sides. We separated our y term from our x term, and we put, in, we put our exponent all on one side. And now, and we've taken our dependent thing, we put it all on the left side. And now we can move the end down, just like what I did. And we can also, by the way, following the same exact rules, because kd is kd to the um, 1 over kd equals kd to the minus 1. So therefore, we follow the same rule to break out the kd. And it looks more complicated, but it's actually not. Because what we have there is we have a straight line. Go back and look at that. If you look at that line on the bottom, you have y, log y, uh, uh, and the y-axis can be log of y over 1 minus y. Then you have n, which is a slope. You have log of l, which can be your x. And you have minus log of kd, which will be your intercept or your b. You have turned the exponential equation the, the hyperbola, or the sigmoidal, into a straight line. And you've done it mathematically by following all the good rules of math, so it's universally applicable. That's the great thing about math. So that means if you make this weird, um, this weird plot, it's called the Hill plot after its inventor, uh, then you have log of fractional binding over 1 minus fractional binding, and again, sorry that it's theta, but in your mind you can change it to y. Maybe it's a little bit con less confusing because I'm talking about y-axis and stuff like that. Anyways, if you have that on the y-axis and you have log of the Ligon concentration or the partial pressure on the x-axis, you take the logs of both those axes and it turns out that those will straighten out your lines, your binding curves, and make them straight. For myoglobin, a simple hyperbola, it will straighten it out into a flat line. For hemoglobin, it'll straighten it out into three flat lines because technically what you have is you have three different situations for the protein. You have all T, all R, and then you have the transition between them. Each of those gets its own line and has its own slope here. So the really cool thing about this is that the lines end up, the, the slope of the line, remember from our equation, the slope of the line is N. N is the number of available cooperative binding sites. So what's really cool is that if you look at this, myoglobin ends up with a slope of 1, which makes perfect sense. In the middle of the graph, hemoglobin ends up with a slope of 3. Well, that makes sense because you want it to be 4 or less because you only have 4 binding sites. Um, and it, it's actually reasonable. It's, uh, it's a reasonable. It shows that the binding sites are cooperating with each other, that um, they're cooperating with each other. They're acting as sort of like three binding sites cooperating together. Maybe there's a little bit of, in real life actually, this number is usually around 2.7 or something like that, because usually the um, cooperativity is reduced from its ideal value. But this is what happens, and you can measure it. You can measure how many binding sites are cooperating with each other, and that's really cool. So what you've done is mathematically, you've straightened out that sigmoidal, the slope of the plot is the degree of cooperativity among the sites. No cooperativity is 1. Lots of cooperativity in this case is 3. The maximum n for hemoglobin is 4, but in real life we measure something around 3 because there's not perfect cooperativity. It's not like as soon as one thing binds, the, the other ones completely snap into shape, but they're influenced toward binding more. So that means that we can do experiments now and we can mess with hemoglobin. So we can put it at different pHs. That's the first thing that you'd want to do. And actually, I had a question about acidosis, which is more covered in Biochem 2. But acidosis, you can have acid in your blood. When you have acidosis, what does that do to your hemoglobin? Interesting experiment and important and figured out uh, early, um, long ago. Well, you see what happens is as you have more acid, as the pH goes down, which means that you have the proton concentration going up, right? As you have more acid, the binding curve shifts 
to the right and down. That means that you have what's going on structurally at that point. You have changed the R to T transition at that point. And so how in the world are you changing that? Well, remember the T state is formed by these electrostatic interactions, and one of them has a pKa close enough to 7 that it could be um, influencing what happens there structurally. And in fact, if we look at the C-terminus, remember there was a histidine there. The more protonate, protons are around, the more protonated that histidine is, and the more that conformation will be influenced, will be produced in solution. The more T conformation you have, the less oxygen binding you'll have because T is the lower affinity state. This is what I'm talking about with cause and effect that you have to work yourself through. So the more protons are around, the lower the pH, the lower the affinity of that hemoglobin is going to be for oxygen, the lower the binding curve, and the more T state you're going to have because you are promoting this reaction. Now this is just one protonation that promotes the T state. It turns out that there's a lot of, there's like at least three or four or five protonations and they all promote the T state, which makes us think that there's something biologically relevant to this because they're all pointing in the same direction. But this is the one that we've introduced before and this one makes sense in what we've done. This is another view where you can have um, the added proton. When you have more acid, the added proton can help promote positive charge on the Hiss and therefore the salt bridge between the Hiss and the ASP that tightens up the T state. And that means that the whole protein is shifted more toward the low affinity state for oxygen and that means that oxygen binds less. You're sort of pushing on the C terminus and you're sort of causing the, the sites to move more. You're causing the iron to move down. You can think of it that way. So this is called the Bohr effect, by the way, because the person who discovered it was Dr. Bohr. Uh, his son, Niels Bohr, was the famous Bohr that you may have heard of from the Bohr model of the atom. Niels Bohr was a prominent physicist, but his father was a biochemist. So um, his father was the one that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm glad that he did that stuff. So his father is the one that I sort of feel like I'm closer to. <laughs> but there's even more because the N-terminus can do something too. Hemoglobin has an N-terminus that can, under certain con concentrations of carbon dioxide, it can actually undergo this reaction, and the carbon dioxide can bind to the N-terminus. When that happens, a proton is given off, which means that the local region pH drops. This is pretty amazing, because it means that carbon dioxide in the solution will promote a lower pH, which will promote the T state, which will demote or promote less oxygen binding, okay? So you have carbon, when carbon dioxide goes on, oxygen comes off. Isn't that exactly what we want hemoglobin to do? So this is really amazing. Carbon dioxide and oxygen can compete even though they bind at different places because carbon dioxide can promote the T state, which will push the oxygen off. This is what I'm talking about when we have cause and effect all mixed up because this is all happening at equilibrium, which means you have Le Chatelier's principle type stuff going on. That's why we taught it to you in uh, Gen Chem, because it can have an effect on how your blood works, okay? So it's all spelled out right here. And the opposite's true. When you have more CO2, you have less oxygen binding. When you have more oxygen around, higher concentrations of oxygen, then you have less CO2 binding. Um, this can cause issues, but that's why we have it on the homework. That's why I'm talking about it now. The bottom line is that hemoglobin's an amazing chemical machine. And it's, uh, we can understand it mechanistically. We can understand how the mechanism works. And so we have all these things that are going on with hemoglobin. It's not just like myoglobin, but it's what happens when you put four myoglobins together. And when you have those things connected, you have cooperativity, and cooperativity causes all these things to work. So I have a lot of, um, this is obviously a lot going on here. I want you to see some movies. Um, so I mentioned 
did I mention Jana Iwasa before? Anyways, there's the scientist, Jana Iwasa, who focuses not on uh, doing lab research, but on science communication, which I think is just as important. And she does these amazing molecular animations, and everything in her molecular animations is supported by the data. And so I have movies that she has posted, and I put them all on Canvas already. Um, so I want you to look at those. I want you to uh, notice these things about this. So sort of like, uh, you know, like draw, the, notice how you have the hemoglobin not moving until you have two oxygens binding, not one. That's the sign of cooperativity. And therefore, you, uh, you also have the accuracy that she puts in. The Hemoglobin 3 movie is going to be something different. So I want you to look at that, and then we'll get back to that, because that will have to do with our first medical application of hemoglobin biochemistry. But that's enough for this lecture. So um, go watch those videos, and then we'll have another half hour or so to finish it up.